Jesse. Oh, oh, progress. <laughs> We're getting close. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. We're almost there. Well, good evening, and we do apologize for the technical difficulties this evening. Thank you for the kindness of your patience. We do appreciate it, and we'll go ahead and begin. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council. It is uh, our regular meeting, Tuesday, May 10th, 2022. It is not 5.30 p.m. It is 6.18 p.m. That's our start time. We're at the Veterans Memorial Hall, 209 Surf Street in Morro Bay. Um, thank you for that, and with that, I'll ask the clerk to establish a quorum, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Addis? Here. Here. Council Member Ford? Here. Council Member Heller? Here. Council Member Varden? Here. And Mayor Heading? Present. We do have a quorum. I'll call the meeting to order and ask in your own way if we could just take a moment of silence remembering those in need. Thank you. And thank you. And if I can have Councilmember Barton lead us in the pledge, if you'll stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That. Thank you. And, um, I will ask our esteemed city attorney, Mr. Neumeyer, do we have a closed session report, sir? No closed session items to report, Mr. Mayor. All right, that brings us to council member and um, our city manager reports. Let's start with council member um, Heller, back from a great vacation. I have nothing to report, but I want to thank all of you who put up with the technical difficulties. This has never happened before, and I just uh, thank you very much for your patience. That's all. Thank you, council member. Council member Martin. Okay, I attended a um, what's called a RAC meeting, and that stands for um, Water Resources Advisory Committee um, over in SLO, and I had not been there in person. I've done, done it a number of times on Zoom, but I had not been there in person before. It was very, very interesting to hear they were making reports on water conditions in different cities and towns around the county, and it was um, some of them are pretty dire. It was really uh, interesting to hear. Um, and then, just for heck, I helped serve lunch to the car show participants on behalf of Morro Bay and Bloom. We had a fun time, a little too windy, but otherwise it was, a, it was nice to, to get to see people from the car show. So that's it. Very good. Thank you. Council Member Addis, please. Yes, I got to um, attend HAB last Thursday, and there was a lot going on at that meeting. But a couple quick announcements is that youth sailing is starting for the summer through the Yacht Club, and there is going to be an upcoming marine swap meet on Saturday, June 25th from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. that you can find out at friendsofthembhd.org. Uh, there was also a very robust presentation from the Quota Club and um, an honoring a tribute, beautiful tribute by the chair, uh, Madam Chair Hansen for George Lee, who recently passed away. Thank you, Council Member Ford, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in light of um, the amount of time that we have, I'm going to skip most of my announcements. Um, but if you're interested in knowing what events are coming up in Morro Bay, I encourage you to visit morrobay.org. They're all listed there. Um, but I do want to touch on um, something that I learned about our local elementary school, Del Mar Elementary. Um, I'm really proud of our school. Um, you know, being a PTA president there for a few years, my daughters went there. Um, I have a strong connection to that school. It means, it means a lot to me. And I recently d um, heard that they are the recipients 
of what in the past was called California Distinguished Schools, but it has been renamed because of, in light of our pandemic and all of the changes that had to occur in schools, they renamed it. And it is now called the California Pivotal Practice Award. And there's four categories that our school had to meet, and they did. And those categories are student engagement, tech triage, partner provisions, and social emotional support. And um, not only did Del Mar meet all of those requirements, but they qualified and they, and they won <laughs> this distinguished honor. And um, there was over 10,000 schools that had applied and only seven received it in the state of California, 700, sorry, received it in the state of California and one out of, um, one of two in our school district. So um, I'm just really proud of our school and our, our administration there and our teachers that have worked so hard and still are continuing to work tirelessly to catch up our students who um, are struggling due to the pandemic and, and the effects that it had on them. So congratulations, Del Mar Elementary. I'm proud of you. And that is all that I'm going to announce this evening. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good news for our Del Mar Elementary School. Fantastic. A couple of announcements on um, May the 24th at 3.30 p.m. We'll have a special meeting to um, go over our budget for the next fiscal year. That's 3.30 p.m. on uh, May the 24th. Um, we're right here. And then also on the 25th, we'll have a special meeting May 25th to discuss the wastewater treatment facility, uh, capital improvement projects, funding, spending, uh, schedule, et cetera, and also um, a detailed report on the Harbor Enterprise Fund. And then lastly, I attended the um, Regional Transportation Authority meeting, the RTA meeting on 5-4. Um, they opened their new bus facility on Elks Lane in San Luis Obispo on 3-18, and I attended the ribbon cutting. Um, fantastic new facility. Um, funded by TIFIA money, uh, similar to WIFIA, um, which is funding our wastewater treatment facility. Their interest rate was zero point, is 0.68%. Amazing, uh, unheard of, especially today. And um, they are struggling with uh, meeting their schedules. And so for many of you that maybe are riders, um, there is an extreme shortage of uh, uh, bus drivers or transportation drivers and they are recruiting like crazy. So if you know anybody that might be interested in being fully trained and ready to be a certified um, a bus and or transportation driver, um, please contact myself or the RTA in San Luis Obispo. They're looking for folks to maintain their schedule. Thank you. Mr. Collins, any reports, sir? Um, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, two quick announcements from our Public Works Director, Greg Quallett. Thank you, City Manager Collins. Um, my announcement is related to a Prop 218 notice that the rate payers, um, the, the garbage rate payers of City of Morro Bay um, will receive in the next week or so. Um, so as you all know, Prop 218 um, is a process by which um, haulers or, or uh, water companies or wastewater companies can um, increase rates. Uh, and so the hauler is going to be asking for two rate increases um, totaling 9.07% uh, of their current bill. And um, though that increase is related to implementation of SB 1383, the purpose of which is to reduce organic waste in landfills and reduce methane emission into our atmosphere. Uh, one of those, um, so th there's two components to that. One is for the anaerobic digester facility. Uh, which uh, is not adequately funded at this time, and another is for uh, an, an increase in trucks for the haulers fleet uh, in order to comply with SB 1383. Uh, and in addition, the IWMA uh, has a 5.4 percent increase also for implementation of SB 1383. So altogether, we're looking at about 14.5 um, uh, percent um, of, of rates coming in on that uh, notice. Um, it's actually a bit less because the IWMA already had, uh, I think, a 2.5 percent fee. Um, so it's, it's actually around 12 or 13 percent of an, of an actual increase. Um, and then um, folks will be able to take a look at that notice. They can contact the city with any questions. We're going to put something up on our website as well. Um, and folks can contact the Public Works Department with any questions. Uh, also the hauler and the IWMA if interested. Um, and then eventually there will be a public hearing uh, on June 28th. Um, 
and um, in individuals uh, who disagree with the rate increases can come and protest those rate increases uh, at that hearing um, at City Council. So uh, that is my update. Was there another update you had for me? I think Paul Miko with Corello. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So Paul Miko is going to come up. There's been a development uh, with the WARF program. Thank you, Hi, Paul. thanks. Uh, Mayor, Council, and uh, community members, I just wanted to let you know we're going to be coming out with a couple of announcements uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Anvil, our contractor, is going to be moving to back over to Maine and Quintana and start working the small diameter purified water line back toward the roundabout. They're also going to be moving down in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think the date was uh, May 23rd for both of these, down by South Bay and Quintana, and then working that purified water line back toward the roundabout. So they'll have two crews kind of going toward the... Uh, Roundabout, and then um, good news, I think, or I think it's good news, is Las Tunas will open by the end of June. So that's all I had. Thank you, Paul. Scott, anything else? Okay, thanks. That ends our announcements for this evening. It brings us to a, a number of presentations that we have, and the first one um, is um, um, a recognition of one of our former uh, council member is a real uh, cornerstone of this community, and I'd like to um, invite up any members of the League family to the podium that might be, be here this evening. We have a special uh, proclamation um, for uh, Mr. George League, who served on the council for four years and was uh, um, a major business uh, person in the community. So I'll welcome up the League family. Welcome. You. And uh, this is a proclamation from the City Council of the City of Morro Bay. Um, whereas the City of Morro Bay has learned with profound sorrow of the passing of George William League, uh, former Morro Bay City Council member, lifelong Morro Bay businessman, entrepreneur, and community member. And whereas the League family moved to Morro Bay in 1952. Wow, amazing and acquired the cannery at 225 Main Street where George worked in the family business, procuring and processing oysters, sea urchins, abalone, and other seafood. And whereas George proudly served his country as a drill sergeant in the United States Army during the Vietnam War. Whereas in 1964, George worked for his father-in-law at the iconic Harbor Hut restaurant eventually taking over management and purchasing the business in 1978. And whereas in 1981, George partnered in Brebby's Restaurant, which eventually became Great American Fish Company Restaurant under George's ownership, one of the Morro Bay Waterfront's most noticeable and successful businesses that George owned and operated with his family until his recent passing. Whereas in the early 1980s, George launched and operated the popular and unique Tiger's Folly 2 dinner cruise uh, boat in Morro Bay. And whereas in 1988, George built the successful Harbor House Inn on Beach and Main in Morro Bay. And whereas George was a partner in several other business ventures in Morro Bay, including the Outrigger, a Brannigan's Restaurants, among others. And whereas George served on the city council as a city council member for the city of Morro Bay from December of 2010 through December of 2014. And whereas George was appointed to vice mayor to serve in 2013. And whereas George will be remembered in the city and by the city and our community as a dedicated and passionate community member, businessman, and father who anchored several business legacies in Morro Bay and left this community a better place. And I just want to say personally, I had the pleasure uh, not of serving with George on the city council, but knowing him uh, personally, um, he was a patient of mine, and, and um, I just so appreciate all of his dedication. I learned a lot in, in um, reading this proclamation. Appreciate his service to our country in serving in Vietnam, and. George will always be remembered as that guy who was always down on the waterfront every day of the week and um, uh, contributed greatly to the growth of business in this community. So we are grateful to you and your family. We share um, in your loss um, and your sorrow. Um, we're saddened to see George leave us. 
Um, but his memory will linger in the city forever. You should know that. And we thank you for being here tonight and certainly would welcome any comments that you folks would like to make. Some big, some deep shoes to fill there, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's going to be kind of hard to talk. But, um, you know, he really loved Morro Bay, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, we are definitely sad to see him go. But in his, the end there, he um, was happy, had a lot of pain, um, got to see his family around him. And uh, because of him, we have the legacy to carry on, and we're going to do our best to do it. But um, he loved being on the city council. I know that for a fact. Um, so we used to talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. and just uh, you guys really made it great for him to come up here and be part of Morro Bay, and it just continued or finished his legacy by being able to do that. So thank you. It's an honor to have this. Appreciate it. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate it. Cherise, yeah, yeah. Okay. totally, totally understand. <laughs> well, thank you again for being here tonight, and and um, just know that he he will remain in our hearts and forever be known as as that guy that contributed so much to Morro Bay, and, and we uh, share in your loss this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to invite up, let's see, our second presentation this evening. It's National Foster Care Month, and Philippe Gonzalez from San Luis Obispo County Social Services. Philippe, welcome. It's my pleasure to present the proclamation from the City Council to you this evening. This is a proclamation of the City Council of the City of Morro Bay proclaiming May as National Foster Care Month. And it reads as this, um, whereas the City of Morro Bay recognizes the importance of providing children safe, healthy, and loving homes when they are unable to remain in the home of their biological family, and whereas there are more than 430,000 children in the United States in the foster care system, and whereas more than 60,000 children in California are in foster care, and whereas there are over 350 children, youth, and teenagers in the county of San Luis Obispo who are in foster, the foster care system, and whereas to help these children have a healthy, loving, and stable home environment where they can thrive, feel connected to a community that cares for them, and to support the resource families that provide these critical homes. The City of Morro Bay is acknowledging National Foster Care Month to raise awareness about the need for more resource family homes in our county for local children and, and will join other organizations to celebrate resource families in our community. And whereas this effort along with similar celebrations in all 50 states and in the District of Columbia will offer children the chance to live with a healthy, loving, and stable resource that families, when they, can, uh, when they cannot live with their birth families and encourage other dedicated individuals to make a powerful difference in the lives of a child through resource family care. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Morro Bay do hereby proclaim May as National Foster Care Month in the City of Morro Bay and in doing so, we urge all citizens to join in a national effort to raise awareness about the importance of foster care and resource family care. And um, I just wanted to say, Mr. Gonzalez, that um, my wife and I have had the privilege in our younger years of being foster parents to over 20 foster children in our lives that uh, came through our home at various stages of of their growth and development. And uh, I can just attest to the joy and the great um, honor it is to be able to participate in the growth of young people who are displaced, that don't have loving, caring places to, to live, and don't have um, a loving family to put their arms around them and just take care of them. And so that's just my personal affirmation of what the work that you're doing. And, and it's a challenge to our community to rise up and be part of the system. And I, if you'd like to say a few words, um, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Felipe Gonzalez, and I'm a program specialist with the Department of Social Services. I would like to begin by thanking Morro Bay City Council for presenting the Department of Social Services with this proclamation. During the month of May, we are incredibly proud to honor all of our county's foster and adoptive families 
as well as all of the county staff and community partners that support these families. At any given time, our agency has approximately 350 children, youth, and teens in care, and only 120 active homes to care for them. Our youth come into care through no fault of their own and are often the victims of abuse, neglect, abandonment, or mental illness. In the past, our agency has worked alongside the city of Morro Bay to help raise awareness to this need, and the need now is greater than ever. Our agency is still reeling from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and its negative effect on our already strained number of existing resource family homes. When faced with a deficit of this magnitude, we struggle to provide even the most basic resource family matching and are often forced to place a youth anywhere there is an available bed. This leads to resource family fatigue if it is not a good match and further placement stability issues if the youth requires an additional placement move. Our hope in sharing this information today is to help bring more eyes to a very present crisis we are facing in our own backyard. Our goal is to recruit, train, and support the, the development of many more resource family homes in our county. This will yield a greater opportunity for our department to place a youth where they have the best opportunity to heal and thrive while in our care. Each new resource family brings with it an opportunity to serve multiple youth in our county's care and also provide additional support for our existing resource families who have gone above and beyond serving our youth during this deficit. We would now like to show uh, a brief video that, we, uh, that we've created. I'm afraid we're not going to be able to. Technically, and we I have totally problems. So understand. sorry about that, yes. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I've been assured by uh, the city clerk that um, we'll try to go ahead and get that video circulated on social media as well. Great. So um, lastly, I'd like to say thank you again for recognizing May as National Foster Care Month in San Luis Obispo County. If anyone is interested in learning about how to help these youth in care, please visit www.slowfostercare.com or call 805-781-1705. Thank you again, have a good evening. Felipe, thank you so much. And um, again, uh, I appreciate um, you being here and the recognition of foster care. You know, foster families grow as much as these children grow as well. One caveat, those 20 children were not in our house all at one time. <laughs> it was over a number of years, so. I just wanted to point that out. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you. You bet. Appreciate it. Our next um, proclamation is um, for one of our esteemed, yet maybe sometimes unseen heroes um, in the city. Um, and that is a proclamation that recognizes um, National Public Works Week. And we have a number of um, our folks here. Come on up. <laughs> Wherever you are, I see you're hanging around. and. Yeah, all right. We got some. We have a slight detour. We could have used that earlier in the meeting. <laughs> all right, great staff. Um, on behalf of the city council, it is my great privilege to um, declare National Public Works Week as May 15th through May 21st, 2022, um, titled Ready and Resilient. And this is a proclamation of the Morro Bay City Council, and it reads as such. Whereas the public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, emergency management, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of people of the city of Morro Bay, and whereas these infrastructures, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts, and I mean that dedicated efforts, of the public works professionals who are federally mandated first responders, and the engineers, managers, maintenance workers, leads, analysts, operators, and support staff uh, all, at all levels of government and our private sector partners who are responsible for rebuilding, maintaining, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, wastewater systems, public buildings, parks, street trees, and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest of the citizens, civic leaders, and children in the city of Morro Bay to gain knowledge and maintain ongoing interest and the understanding of the importance of public works, first responders, and public works programs in their respective communities. 
And whereas the year 2022 marks the 62nd annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association and the Canadian Public Works Association. And whereas the women and men comprising the Public Works Department in the city of Morro Bay are dedicated to building, maintaining, and beautifying our critical infrastructure in the service of improvements in the quality of life of Morro Bay residents and visitors through the projects such as the water reclamation facility, which will provide long-term water supply resiliency and the transit hub improvements project, which will upgrade the city's transit hub and an aesthetically pleasing shelter design for riders and create enhanced accessibility. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Morro Bay do hereby designate the week of May 15th through 21st, 2022 as National Public Works Week. And I urge all um, agencies and activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions that they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these folks are the behind the scenes folks that you don't see every day, but that um, really are the heartbeat of public health and safety for our community. And I am proud to introduce Mr. Qualick, who will probably say a few words about his and our great staff. Thank you, Mr. Qualick. Thank you, Mayor. A few short words. First of all, I'm proud to be standing with um, everyone that's here from the Public Works Department. This is a very dedicated group. As you mentioned in your proclamation, Mayor, uh, the American Public Works Association uh, has a theme for this year's Public Works Week, and that's readiness and resiliency. Um, I just want to say a couple of words on, on how true that is for, for this group standing behind me. Number one, um, this group uh, is just on it. Um, when, if we have an emergency, um, they are figuring out solutions within minutes. We have folks here who um, are on call oftentimes, so we, we always have folks that are on call who um, sacrifice time from their families to come out in the middle of the night when there's an emergency. Um, and also just ready for all the challenges we face, whether it's um, related to a complex technical issue in a capital project that no one will ever know about, um, or so some finance situation that we're working through. So uh, we are ready and we are resilient as well. I know that this group, um, much more than I, um, have, have been impacted by, by the pandemic here in the city of Morro Bay um, through some very difficult times, uh, short staffing, some, some budget issues um, during the pandemic, um, and, and other issues going on, and they have just put in their all, um, nevertheless, every day. So again, we thank you for uh, the proclamation. Uh, we remain dedicated and ready to serve. Does anyone want to say a couple of words? Anybody? Public words. All right. <laughs> and thank you, Pam, for dressing up. This is, uh, this is something of a symbol for us this year, um, <laughs> unfortunately, but great costume. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Very much appreciated and look forward to seeing you. And thank you for maintaining our city. We, we very much appreciate you. Thanks. And that brings us, let's see, to our second to last presentation tonight. Um, way in the back, we have, uh, I think, Chief McCrane, you're up front here, Chief Dan McCrane, from our Morbay Fire Department. And we have a number of our first responders with us. Come on up, gang. Sorry about the wait. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. And uh, this, again, is a special group of people. This is a proclamation of the city, of, uh, city Council of the City of Morro Bay declaring the week of May 15th through 21st, 2022 as Emergency Medical Services Week. And it reads as such, whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service, and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. They left that out. And it says, whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury, and whereas emergency medical services has grown to fill a gap by providing important out-of-hospital care including preventive medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine, and 
whereas the emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, um, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public and other, and, um, and other out of hospital medical care providers, and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value of the accomplishment of emergency medical services providers by designating the Emergency Medical Services Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Morro Bay City Council does hereby proclaim the week of May 15th through 21st, 2022 as Medical Emergency Medical Services Week. And I'll just say this. Having uh, been in medicine for 45 years, when I started, there was no such thing as an emergency medical services provider outside of the hospital. And the morbidity and mortality rate across the world, but also mainly in this country, has gone down significantly because of the training and expertise of these individuals and the pre-hospital care that is given before you ever arrive in the emergency room. You folks are lifesavers. We appreciate you greatly in all that you do, and we are so proud that you're part of the city of Morro Bay. Thank you for what you do. Chief McCrane. Thank you, um, Mayor, City Council. Thank you for this recognition. Um, it's really been an honor to be selected to lead these dedicated professionals. Um, they do, they go out and provide a service to the community every day. Uh, this year, the American College of Emergency Physicians, this is their 47th year of uh, recognizing EMS Week. And this year's theme is rising to the challenge. And given the events of the last two years, that's really significant. These guys really did rise to the challenge with um, COVID and providing that additional level of care to the public. And just wanted to thank them for all their dedicated service. Appreciate that. Gang, any comments, anything to say? Not, nope, I don't want to put you on the spot. You bet. Thank you all for your service. And um, sadly, I gave my age away with the amount of service that I uh, provided for medicine. So I apologize for that. Thank you, guys. Um, now that brings us to uh, a presentation uh, by Vistra Energy Company. Um, tonight we have with us Brad Watson. Um, to make a presentation on um, the potential uh, battery, battery energy storage facility that currently is being vetted through the city of Morro Bay and perhaps an update on some of the things that are going on with Mr. Brad. Uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Look forward to your presentation and, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Heading and council members, uh, city manager Collins and staff. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to appear before you tonight. Councilman uh, Heller said that the technical difficulties have never happened before, and this is my first time here, so I hope I'm not a hex. So I uh, hope it never happens again next time I come by. So Dana, is the PowerPoint available or not? Okay, so we're going to go with a straight presentation, but it will still be chock full of new information uh, and a little bit of refreshed information, some of which you may have heard before already as we wanted to appear before you. Really, it's been about a year now since... Um, we made our first public presentation to the uh, council about what we would like to do to transition the Morro Bay power plant that's now retired into the utility um, uh, battery storage project that we hope to um, we hope to get built one day sooner than later. So let me give you a bit of um, uh, a bit of background um, and uh, about Vistra and what it's doing uh, and. A little bit of a, is that better? Okay, okay. Uh, a little bit about us again. Uh, Vistra is a Fortune 275 company. We're based in Irving, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. So we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We're an integrated energy company, which means we own power plants and um, storage facilities, and then we sell it through retail brands. We operate in 20 states, including uh, obviously California, but throughout uh, the Midwest into the Mid-Atlantic, Texas, and up into the Northeast, even Washington, D.C. Um, 
we are a leader in the transition of the American power grid from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Uh, Vistra is targeting as a foundation, we have a, a, a goal of net zero by 2050, which means we are wanting to reduce our carbon emissions down to a level in 2030 of about uh, a 60 percent reduction and then take it all the way down to net zero by 2050 uh, with the, a bit of a caveat that we have to have government policy direction and decisions, but also the technology to go along with it. So we're, we're doing that by um, methodically retiring coal plants that we still operate, but importantly where we're shifting and pivoting now is to building out renewable energy in states such as California. In other states, we're building solar and battery storage, but here we are focusing on battery storage at three power plant sites that we already own in Oakland, in Moss Landing, and of course in, uh, in Morro Bay. In Oakland, we have a, a power plant which is uh, 110 megawatts with four combustion turbines. It's uh, near the Port of Oakland, just south of uh, the downtown area, and uh, we're required to run those turbines, by the way, because uh, by the grid operator, because in parts of Oakland they have congestion issues. There's just not enough power getting into where it needs to be. So we're hopeful to have PG&E come in, resolve those congestion issues, and when they finally get those upgrades done sometime this year, we're going to retire those remaining combustion turbines in Oakland, and we are going to build out through two phases 80 megawatts of battery storage there. In Moss Landing, we still have a natural gas power plant, the Moss Landing power plant, 1,020 megawatts, powers over half a million homes. But at that large site, uh, of which I think everybody has visited on the council right now and some of the staff members, you know it's a big site. So in late 2020, we uh, built 300 megawatts of battery storage there, and then last year opened up another 100 megawatts of battery storage there. Moss Landing is the largest battery storage project in the world, and uh, we just got approval from the California Public Utility Commission, and design and start work is starting for 350 megawatts more of battery storage, with the hope that we can add even 750 megawatts more eventually at, uh, at Moss Landing. And then, of course, in Morro Bay, in late 2020, I think it was December, we put in permit applications to put in a 600 megawatt facility here at the uh, Morro Bay power plant site. Let me go over uh, some updates now about where we are uh, with the, uh, with the uh, project and some things that we're looking for now uh, to take a bold step forward to get the uh, regulatory process underway. As I said, it's a 600 megawatt uh, project that we have applied for and we seek to, uh, to build out here using lithium ion batteries. Uh, the project would be on 22 acres of the former tank farm site, which you've all visited uh, in a day that was a little calmer than what you have right now with some of the wind. Uh, but uh, the uh, tank farm sits next to the uh, generation building in the stack. Vistra it remains excited and committed to building out this project here at Morro Bay because it is an ideal site for battery storage for a number of reasons. The Central Coast location. The existing infrastructure is there. We don't have to build anything new. The Department of Toxic Substances Control, as you know, has put land use covenants on the 22 acres where we want to build our project, really isolating it to industrial uses. So it's just the right site to do so. Uh, then, of course, there's the PG&E substation that ties it directly into the KISO grid. So uh, California needs the power. We all saw the headlines over the weekend of Governor Newsom, CPUC, CECA, CEC saying in the near term, California may not have enough power during um, net peak periods this summer, but that also extends years out as well. So California, Central Coast need the power. Um, additionally, though, when it comes to Morro Bay and what it would do for this community, there are so many pluses on multiple levels. Um, the approval and the construction of this project would finally, finally unlock the potential of that site by putting in the battery storage 
and then through a land use plan amendment that would allow that to happen, but also a master plan uh, that would be part of that amendment would then allow for the battery storage to be built, the demolition to follow once the batteries are in, and remember that would be at district's expense, and then the master plan opens up the rest of that site for whatever is next. That's what is at stake here by getting this done in a timely way with balanced cost, is to try to move this site forward finally after all these years. So we think that's uh, just a, a big plus, as I say, on, on so many levels. Now, as far as market conditions, we're all living with inflation now. We're all going through that right now, and it's certainly uh, affecting what we're trying to do as well. Across the board, economy-wide, we've all heard those stories. I won't go into a lot of details about labor, supply chain, and so forth, but uh, raw materials in particular are affecting what Vistra and other companies are doing to build battery storage projects. Uh, and they're hitting us uh, pretty, pretty severely. We are now hearing a lot from our uh, vendors uh, of limits they have, so much so that, and Councilman Heller, you were in construction. This council knows building anything as far as a capital project, you want to have a contract with a fixed price for what you're building. We are having a difficult time right now coming up with fixed prices for some of these batteries because of the raw materials that go into them. Uh, some vendors now are coming up with a raw, uh, a rare earth materials price index adjustment as part of the contract. So you have kind of a moving target on what you're going to pay while you're trying to do a contract. It's not an easy thing to do right now. Um, so those, those are some of the challenges. Just before I came over here today, I looked up what some of the, the, the uh, prominent rare earth materials or rare earth elements are that go into some of these batteries. In the last year, year over year, price increase for lithium, 419%. Nickel, up 58% year to year. Cobalt, nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries like we have at Moss Landing, 81% increase in what the cost is. These are world commodities, so it's a world market out there. So uh, overall, we're seeing uh, at Vistra up to a 40% increase in the capital cost per kilowatt hour to develop our projects. Regardless, we are still pursuing them. And that includes Morro Bay in the pipeline. We are still pursuing projects. Um, and as the awareness of what we're doing in California, at Oakland, at Moss Landing, and Morro Bay, and of course, what we're doing elsewhere around the nation, um, we are starting to also get unsolicited inquiries. And we've gotten a number here in California as well from other entities, owners of commercial property who are saying, look, we have this many acres next to a substation. We want to talk to those people. So as we also pursue opportunities, we're also being solicited by others for uh, potential projects in battery storage here in California. Where that leaves us is that Vistra is opportunistically evaluating renewable investment dollars allocation by potential projects. What that essentially means as we look at where we are going to build, we want to look at how timely the project is. First of all, can we get in, get the planning process done, the regulatory requirements, and get the project underway? And the other thing is we want projects that are going to have balanced costs within means to allow us to get the rate of return that we need to achieve for these projects to make sense financially. So we're looking for those two things. The projects that are in the pipeline being considered, if they have long delays or if the costs become inflated and inflated, then those will move down in priorities or they will be marginalized. And I'm not just talking about Morro Bay. This is all of them out there as we look at this um, holistically. Um, Kurt Morgan, our CEO who was out here, whom you all met in August, is um, just in our earnings call on Friday was saying, Vistra will remain very disciplined in how we develop these projects. We want to optimize, lock in value, manage the risks, and move these projects forward. 
to deliver renewable energy to California, but also to make sure that there are returns here for the investment dollars that we are putting into them as well. Uh, that said, as far as the development pro pro uh, uh, progress for our project, we're still excited about this project. It makes so much sense on so many levels to make this happen. Um, we really appreciate the guidance and the input from City Manager Collins and Scott and his development team on help us uh, getting uh, the, the uh, necessary, really heavy lifting done behind the scenes to get to a point where we are now, uh, we're hopeful, to a point where we can get this uh, CEQA process started. All the requested technical work has been submitted, um, but time is critical. Again, it's time to get moving on getting an NOP issued, a notice of preparation under CEQA, our request is, urgent request, respectfully, is that it gets done this month. The sooner that we can get through that process and, and work together, let's try and influence what we can together. There are uncertainties out there with raw earth materials and geopolitics, um, some things we can't control, but the things we can control are working through the process, collaboratively working together, uh, and get it to a point where we get approval, and then we can start with some real contour of the project, look at costs, and how we can lock those things in as best as possible. So uh, our request is to get the uh, notice of preparation under CEQA out this month. Uh, it's on track, we understand, uh, according to the staff, and that would be our uh, our request tonight. Now, I do want to update you with some really positive news about Moss Landing because I know there have been legitimate questions by this council, there have been good questions and also by the public. Uh, Chief McCrane, I know it's uh, something that's important to him about Moss Landing and the two events we had up there that caused those projects that we had just brought online to go into an unforced outage. Good news. We just released information yesterday in a statement that Vista expects to have a substantial portion of its 400 megawatt Moss Landing uh, facility back online for summer. The entire facility will be operational during the summer. Uh, we had corrective actions. They were determined in implementation during completion, including uh, the replacement of the connectors that we are all familiar with now, uh, the water-based heat suppression system and testing. The company anticipates we will have 200 megawatts available in early June. In just a few weeks, 200 megawatts will be back up, another 150 megawatts coming on um, in June as well, a little later on. The remaining 50 megawatts are anticipated to be operational in August. We have to get some replacement batteries and uh, complete the installation. Of course, we're going to be working with our state and local officials there to make sure all the restoration work gets done. As we said uh, at the outset, when these events happen, we as a company would investigate, we'd find out what happened and uh, get to the bottom of it and release it for everybody to understand. So uh, just a quick recap, at the time of the first activation of the safety systems, um, the good news is all the battery modules were working fine. They were working just fine, uh, all operating with their established temperature limits, and we briefed uh, many of you on that before. What happened was smoke detectors were alarmed, causing release of water to the battery heat suppression system, and then uh, we just had a plumbing problem. We had leaks, hoses on heat suppression system, disconnected when the uh, quick connect couplings were undone. So, found out what happened, what were the corrective actions. We complete repairs and commissioning. The quick connect fittings have been tossed. They'll re be replaced with threaded connections, so they're secure. The entire heat suppression system will be pressure tested. Um, and also, we're going to go to multiple systems now uh, of alarms, if you will, before water uh, is activated. So it'll be called a, a dual interlock, which requires both smoke and activation of a battery module sprinkler to release water to the heat suppression system. Uh, that should eliminate activation of the system by smoke that's not associated with battery overheating, which is, you know, in California, when you have wildfires and you have that lot of ambient smoke, that's something you've got to be concerned with. Uh, smoke detectors will be installed in all air handling units to detect any smoke generated in air handling units and outdoors. So we're, um, uh, it was a learning experience for us, but you know, early stage technology, things are gonna happen sometimes that even in design, it isn't anticipated, but we went in, we fixed it, we're gonna be back online in a couple of weeks. And uh, with that, I will uh, 
pause and see if you have any questions. That's the, the latest uh, that we have for you tonight. Well, thank you, Brad. Appreciate that very much. And I'll just ask if any council members have any questions for Brad. Yeah. Council Member Hiller, please. It's more a comment than a question, Brad. I just want to thank you for doing your presentation without your PowerPoint. And uh, it was very concise. And. Uh, Appreciate the information very much on Moss Landing. Sure, and we will, uh, Dana has it, and I will get it to you so you can have it in a digital format so you can see Great. what I was talking about. So. Thank you, Brad. Very much appreciate you being here. Thank you Thank for you. the information. Uh, delighted to be here, and congratulations for meeting in person again. It's, Great. it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be back. Okay, that brings us to public comment. This is, uh, oh, by the way, um, Dana, do we know if our phones are not working or are working? Oh, he's going to find out. You knew I'd ask, yeah. This is a general public comment for items on the agenda for which you can't stay or anything that you'd like to bring up with regards to the city of Morro Bay. I'll start with uh, my speaker slips. No need to fill them out, but if you have, I'll, I'll do those first. Then I will move to any public members that want to make comments. And then lastly, um, see if our phones are working tonight, if there's any calls. So uh, I'm going to start out with um, Linda Winters. Linda. You're going to pass. Okay. Linda passes. Good to see you tonight, Linda. Um, Michael um, Womble. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Michael Womble, Executive Director for Visit Morro Bay. Just want to give you a quick update on tourism and the work that we've been doing. I uh, hope everybody's been able to enjoy the events that are back. Uh, Visit Morro Bay was a driving force behind bringing our Kite Festival back. A great sponsor for our amazing car show that happened this weekend, and we have our 26th, 22nd annual citywide yard sale happening this weekend, which was a driving factor for us to bring back. Uh, <clears throat> I have some exciting news for us. Uh, Morro Bay was picked as the location on the cover for the location scout guide for California, so this will be distributed to 5,000 different location scouts. Uh, this was due to our relationship with Visit Slope Cal. Uh, this is not a paid advertisement. This was picked by the editors of uh, the Location Scout. So uh, they loved this picture so much and, and what it represented for Morro Bay, and they said it could kind of be anywhere in the world. So they loved that. Um, our board of directors have been hard at work. We're working on our new rebranding, which uh, will be um, you'll see come out shortly in the next couple weeks. We have a new tagline that we're not quite ready to release, but uh, you'll see it soon. Um, and also we're in the, in the last stages of our uh, strategic plan, which will be a four-year strategic plan for us, which will be our guiding light for the next four years. That will be tackling our large-scale initiatives. Um, this strategic plan was um, taken on by us, so we have this guiding light. We've had surveys throughout the industry as a holistic view from our hotels, restaurants, activities. We've had interviews and then focus groups gone through, and now we're distilling all that information down, and uh, we'll be coming out with a ro robust plan. Uh, for us to uh, move forward with. Um, outside of that, look great to see everybody in person, and I uh, hope to see you out there this weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate the update very much. Looking forward to the other events coming up and great car show this past weekend. Okay, um, I'll go ahead. Uh, next public comment is Erica Crawford. Welcome, Erica. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council. I'll keep it very brief. Erica from the Chamber. Uh, first, I just wanted to update the Council on our economic development work, uh, specifically our business outreach and bid feasibility study. Uh, we've closed our business survey, uh, but we're continuing to conduct some direct outreach to business owners in the downtown and waterfront economic centers. We're going to be holding our second focus group with business owners this Thursday, March 12th. Um, additionally, the flagpole banner project that's in our scope is complete, uh, and the banners are scheduled to be hung up in the downtown starting tomorrow and on Embarcadero next week. Uh, these banners were produced by a local graphic designer and a, a local sign printing company, so this is a completely locally supported project. Uh, thank you for your partnership at the city, and thank you Public Works. Thank you, Greg, and your staff. Uh, and getting this, it's a small, but it's a meaningful piece of placemaking complete in time for the high season. And um, we look forward to wayfinding sign completion, uh, and that's intended to circulate people through all four of the economic centers. And on that note, the Chamber is conducting a series of listening sessions for business owners in each of North Morro Bay, Quintana, Downtown, and the Waterfront. Uh, we'll be releasing a promotion on this listening tour tomorrow, and we will have completed the tour by the second week of June. Uh, so we'll make sure to keep you all uh, apprised of those dates. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll hold, our th we'll hold our third breakfast on the Bay. Uh, this month, we're focusing on, on economic development, and we're happy to welcome Melissa James, who's the CEO of REACH, Brad Watson, who you just heard of uh, from, from Vistra, 
Tim Cleath, who's a new hotel operator on North Main. Thank you for that hookup, Scott Graham. Uh, and Michael Wambolt, who you just heard from, uh, for tourism. So focusing on economic development and all, all steam ahead. And finally, we have a fun membership mixer scheduled tomorrow night, 5.30 to 7 at Marina Square. Um, and actually, finally, finally, the Chamber and Estero Bay News are holding a candidates mixer. So it's a Meet the Candidates mixer next Monday at Coalesce Bookstore. So all of this information can be found on our website, which is morochamber.org. Thank you. The date of the breakfast, I'm sorry, that was quick. Sorry, Wednesday, May 18th. We, May 18th, Wednesday. Thank yep. you. And same place, same time? Same time, same place. Thank you. OK, thank you. Appreciate it. OK, general public, uh, uh, public comment is still open. Any members of the public wishing to come forward, please do so now. Welcome, Betty. Good evening. My name is Betty Winholtz. Just two items briefly. One, I want to acknowledge and thank um, Anvil for getting uh, South Bay Boulevard open, as they said they would. I know that was announced last week and it actually, or two weeks ago, and it happened, and it was, it's been very nice. Uh, we'll be happy when the roads are smoothed out as well. Um, and then my second point is with regard to something I asked about about a month ago. Um, regarding uh, the trash cans being removed from the uh, harbor walk uh, between the outfall and the rock and wondering where they went and why. Public comment is still open. Seeing no members of the public, do we have any phone? Okay, phone is what, AGP, do we have any phone uh, public comment on our phone lines? Can't hear you, sir. Anthony, if that's you. Testing one, two. We have our mobile transport system working this evening. <laughs> This is Carol Truesdale. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Carol, welcome. Thank you very much. I hope everybody had a wonderful Mother's Day. Um, my question is for Vistra Energy. It was my understanding that the fire that happened at Moss Landing happened to be with the fans that were purchased from an, un, uh, I, don't, I don't know who the manufacturer was. So if this happened with the fans uh, setting off the fire at Moss Landing, what corrective measures have you set in place that this is not gonna happen here in Morro Bay? I know that uh, cost is a factor, and if these fans were inadequate for your uh, battery storage, why didn't you have uh, a, a plan in place to stop it? So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Carol. Um, Scott, do we have any more? <laughs> okay, we have no more public comment. I'll close uh, pub general public comment, bring it back to us. Greg, uh, um, Betty's comment about the, um, the um, uh, trash cans, Betty, was that be between the rock and um, along the, you have a comment? Yeah, I do, I'd like to respond to that, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we did look at that and uh, we noticed that one of the trash cans was removed from that viewing area that's sort of near where the kayakers set up and, and that's true. Uh, the city did remove that because we just didn't want a trash can right at that viewing area and it was moved to Coleman Park. So uh, we, do, we actually do have a trash can at Coleman Park. Um, and I know that for sure because this morning I received a, a photograph of litter around that trash can that uh, we then dispatched our maintenance crew to go to go clean up. So um, currently we have one at Coleman Park. Um, and then there's also one um, going towards Target Rock. I'll have to double check on that one, but I believe that one's still there as well. So, and I'd be happy to talk with Ms. Winholtz after the meeting if she's, if she's still here offline um, about which location she's referencing. You bet, absolutely, thank you for that, I appreciate it. And um, Dana, if we could get uh, Ms. Truesdale a copy of Brad's explanation. Uh, perhaps she didn't hear it, but that was a pretty detailed explanation. Uh, there was no fire, um, it was just a fire alarm that went off, but he did give a detailed information on that, and I'd like to share that with her as well. Good, public comment is now closed. That brings us to item A, our consent agenda. 
Um, items A1 through A9. Uh, public comment is now open for the consent agenda. Any member of the public wishing to come forward on the consent items, please do so now. Seeing nobody in the audience, do we have any calls uh, for public comment on consent? <laughs> Mr. Collins? <laughs> okay, no calls. Public comment is closed. Bring it back to council. Um, any items to pull, first of all? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion for either approval or not. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Councilmember Addis, second by Councilmember Barton to approve A1 through A9. Any further discussion this evening? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote on consent. Councilmember Addis? Yes. Councilmember Ford? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Councilmember Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. That brings us to our first business item this evening. This is item C-1, adoption of resolution number 41-22, approving the engineer's report and declaring the intent to levy the annual assessment for the Cloisters Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District. Mr. Qualick, I believe, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, yes, this is our, our second part of a three-part series for each assessment district. So um, tonight we'll be presenting um, just a very brief summary of the engineer's report. Um, and I'll, I'll do that short verbal presentation. And our city engineer, Eric Ridio, is present and available to answer any questions if, if you have any. So uh, just very, very briefly, the Cloisters District um, was established in 1996. Um, and the city uh, is under an agreement with the Cloisters District to uh, maintain landscaping, hardscaping, as well as all the facilities um, in the Cloister Tract um, that's, that's in the public right of way. Um, we receive as a city $148,944 per year, uh, again in revenue, um, and that revenue is intended um, to pay for that maintenance service um, and that, it, uh, that assessment is, is levied on the individual parcel owners uh, in the district. Um, again, it started in 1996. There has been no CPI escalator at all to, to increase that revenue. So the city has been um, at level revenue, though, as you know, um, costs have been increasing steadily um, in the past 25 years or so. Um, historically, uh, we have um, transferred 10% of the funds um, and I'm not sure how far back, by the way, this history goes, but um, we, we do transfer some of those funds into what we call the Cloisters Accumulation Fund. So just kind of this, this accounting setup we had was that we have the Cloisters Maintenance Fund and we have the Cloisters Accumulation Fund. The idea is if we transfer some monies into the Cloisters Accumulation Fund, we can sort of save up um, uh, funding for capital projects in the Cloisters or larger maintenance level projects in the cloisters. And um, that's certainly a good thing. We have around 142,000 uh, in that fund currently. Um, however, uh, we, we ran some math and we found out that the cost to maintain the cloisters um, exceeds by a good amount, um, $148,944, probably by 30 to $50,000 a year. And so it simply didn't make sense to continue transferring money into accumulation fund if we're saving that 10%, um, but again, it's not actually, uh, we're, we're, we're not reducing our level of effort on the maintenance side. So um, in order to kind of have that make sense, what we've decided to do internally is to, um, and, and, and to propose to you all, is uh, to consolidate those two funds. And so we will retain that balance of $142,000 uh, four projects in the Cloisters District, that's not going to change. Um, but when that $142,000 of surplus funding, saved funding is spent down, we just will no longer have any accumulated funds. And if there's any um, capital needs in the Cloisters District, we will simply come to City Council with those requests just as for any other, any other part. Um, and uh, the one thing I do want to note is that, as I mentioned, costs do go up. Um, and that does not mean, however, that we, that we provide a, a, a lower level of service for maintaining um, that district. Uh, we do have council direction from May of 2004 that says 
any, um, any kind of funds that, that go over the level of revenue that we receive um, to, that, that are required to maintain the park uh, will be subsidized by the general fund. So that, that is already in action. So there won't be any change on the ground for anyone in the cloisters. Um, I already mentioned that we have around $142,000 left uh, to spend on capital projects. Uh, one kind of big one that we've been reviewing with folks in the cloisters, one of which is here still, um, is um, potentially dredging the cloisters pond. That's something that um, is complicated and expensive, but um, as any good engineer will tell you, anything is possible. So uh, there are a lot of reeds that have grown in that pond and have blocked the views um, of the pond. And um, that's unfortunate, but it is a result of sediment that comes from the stormwater runoff that, that, that conveys down. And once the sediment is there, then, then the reeds grow. Um, a couple of years ago, the city tried to remove those reeds. Uh, it did not go well. Removing strong reeds while you're on a little rowboat is, is not, um, it's not a good, not, not a good idea. Um, and um, the reeds grow right back. Um, there are um, a lot of limitations in how we can treat those reeds because it is kind of a habitat area. Uh, so we can't just, you know, put bleach in the pond or something to, to, to kill them all. So re really the, the option that we have left uh, if we want to preserve that pond is some sort of dredging operation. And, um, so we will be looking into that um, and whether that, you know, 142,000 might be able to fund um, an environmental look at that situation. It certainly wouldn't, wouldn't fund the, the entire project. Um, the city of San Luis Obispo not too long ago recently dredged Laguna Lake uh, off of um, Los Osos Valley Road. Um, and uh, those funds actually came from the city, um, from their general fund and their, and their um, newer tax measure that they passed recently. So um, I don't know, I don't remember how much that was, but you know, our dredging project could be anywhere from you know, ballpark from 400 to a million dollars, uh, 400,000 to a million dollars. So we, we don't anticipate that it's a, it's a small project. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap that up there. Um, again, this is just one step in a process by which the city can, can levy the assessment uh, to have a, a continued assessment uh, for continued revenue for maintenance of the cloisters district. So um, the, uh, the recommendation for council tonight uh, is for city council to approve uh, the engineer's report and declare an intent to levy the annual assessment of the cloisters landscaping and lighting maintenance assessment district. And uh, again, I'm available for questions, uh, as is our city engineer who wrote the report. Thank you, Mr. Qualick. Appreciate that. I'll start with a few questions maybe that um, you can answer for me. Um, one is in the staff report, but I'm calling out for public consumption. And that is the fact that uh, you note that the CPI index, when this uh, initial 1996 um, um, fund was established and assessment was established was 157. And at present, or this year, it's 287, which is an 83% drop in purchasing power. Yet your um, department has been able to maintain the same level of service over all those years. Is that, with, with I guess, some some uh, use of the accumulation fund being transferred over? Yes, that's correct. I'm not aware of instances where we've used the accumulation fund to support the maintenance effort. Um, that's typically been reserved for special projects in the Cloisters District. Um, but the, the short answer is uh, yes. I mean, I was not here 20 years ago, so I, I don't, uh, but from, from what I understand, um, we still have the same level of effort on the maintenance side um, with essentially less purchasing power, yes. And uh, if I heard you correctly, the plan now is to, because costs are going up and you, the assessment will not cover y what you need to do there, that you're going to begin using funds from the accumulation fund, which were for capital projects? Um, close. Uh, we won't be using that, that accumulated money for maintenance. Uh, we will reserve that money for uh, capital work or larger maintenance projects. So when we say capital work, uh, you know, we here in the city have a, have a standard definition of what a capital project is. And uh, one of the uh, defining characteristics of a capital project is that it's uh, $50,000 or, or over. Um, but you know there may be a large $20,000 capital project that would be a big project for the cloisters, 
Um, so that fund, uh, those saved m monies uh, would be reserved for, for those sorts of uh, projects, yes. And um, you mentioned um, that costs continue to rise about thirty to fifty thousand dollars a year in order to keep up. That was a quote. Um, is that the maintenance costs? Uh, yeah. So if that was what I said, then I apologize. What, what I meant was, at this time, we believe that um, our cost of, ma of maintaining the cloisters district is approximately thirty to fifty thousand dollars above the revenue that we receive from the cloisters. Okay, I see, thank you for that. And then, um, given that, what's the plan in terms of um, the sources of funds to be able to maintain the same level of uh, maintenance that you have in the past? Yeah, thank you for that question, because that, that dovetails into the idea that um, the city, uh, through council direction in 2004, um, will subsidize uh, maintenance at the cloisters district through general fund. Is there a limit on that? Not that I'm aware of. Is, uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Rios knows, is there a limit on that? I mean, that's, that's an open door, endless amount that could be drawn down from the general fund? I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Sarah. That's okay, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. Okay, so there's a, um, a, a gonna be a shortfall of approximately thirty to $50,000 per Correct. year. 30,000, I'll go in the low side, he's giving me the low sign. Um, a shortfall in terms of maintaining it at the same level it, yeah, that the, the current assessment will not meet. Correct. Um, in order to subsidize that, my term, which I think is an appropriate term, um, that money will come from the general fund. Is there a limit on how much can come from the general fund to subsidize that? There's no legal limit. Okay. And um, have we ever considered um, increasing the assessment? Has that been discussed uh, at all? I don't know the history of that and whether that's been considered in the past. Certainly that's something, and you know, I, I would encourage the city attorney to chime in, but if, if the assessment were to be increased, my understanding is that would have to be a, a, put to a vote of uh, the folks who live in the Cloisters District. Uh, that's correct. Okay, I'm looking at page 34 of your um, uh, staff report. And the very last paragraph says, in order to mitigate the environmental impacts of the project, which was the Cloisters project, and to provide a greater than normal public benefit upon modification of otherwise applicable standards as required in a PD, a PD overlay zone, the conditions of approval for the project required the applicant, which I assume would be the builder, to um, form an assessment district for the maintenance of the public park uh, uh, bicycle pathway right of way landscaping, coastal access ways, um, ESHA, restoration areas and other improved common areas to be privately held or dedicated to the city. Um, the public park area as well as all open space improvements in the assessment district were part of the many detailed discussions during the city and coastal commission hearings. So am I correct in assuming that this was a condition of approval not only by the city but also the coastal commission? That's my understanding. And that was mitigation, is that correct? Yes, for okay. any environmental impacts. And so now the city has is going to bear the burden of mitigation for the development, which inures to those that live there. Is that correct? I'll ask Chris. Is that? If the general fund is subsidizing uh, the work, then yes, the uh, city will be subsidizing the improvements that are occurring out there. And, and again, is that, um, I'm, I apologize, I think you said via ordinance, or is that codified? via an ordinance? My understanding an is that in 2014, council directed uh, staff to supplement the shortfall through general fund. I'm not certain on, on what vehicle that took. Was on that for one year or was that? I, I, I have not reviewed that, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe another staff member knows. Okay, great, thank you. Those are my questions, apologize. Um, other Sorry, questions, Norman council member uh, Ford, please, yes. Well, after after all those questions, I have a, f a couple of remaining ones. Um, one of them is um, you mentioned in the report here that um, eventually the surplus will be exhausted. And do you have any idea? Of, like I, I know you mentioned, you know, dredging, of course, like to just just to explore that opportunity might even drain that um, that surplus fund. Is that? Do you have any idea how long that will last? Great question. Um, I certainly in this 
uh, economy, um, considering inflation, I would not uh, want to predict any and how, how far the money would go. But I would say that um, we work very closely with um, folks in the cloisters uh, in making these decisions. So um, any time we would spend this money, we would be consulting with um, representatives from the cloisters. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I think it's important, thank you. And then um, I had another question that came up when you were talking about dredging, because this wasn't even something I was thinking about till you mentioned that. Um, and so it, has it ever been, you mentioned that they went out there with a boat and tried to pull the reeds and it was unsuccessful. Um, has it ever been dredged before? And if we were to dredge it, how long do you even, would that be another like 20 years before it had to be done again? Yeah, great questions. It hasn't been dredged before. Um, just looking at it, and this, these are all things we'd evaluate, but just looking at it, uh, we believe that we could put in a system of check dams that uh, would actually run along that ditch parallel to, to the one um, that would allow for kind of water to t tip over the check dam but leave the sediment behind so that in the future we'd be pulling sediment out of those check dams but not the pond itself. Um, again, technically possible, but we, we don't have a full design or environmental or evaluation of it. But that would be the idea to, to put in some system where we wouldn't have to dredge the pond again. Okay, so that sounds pretty involved. Dredging and then that system as well, so it'd be a pretty good project, pretty sizable project. Okay, and um, I just wanted to say that I, I did attend via, um, I think Zoom, or <laughs> however they did it with AGP for the um, joint PWAB and the Rec and Parks meeting where you guys went around to all the different parks and talked about capital improvement and that sort of thing. And there was some really great ideas that were thrown out there, so um, I think it's wonderful that, uh, that we're, you know, looking at that and, and, like you said, reaching out to their community, the Cloisters community, and, and getting in touch with them on what projects are in the future. But um, that's all, those are the only questions I have, so thank you. Thank you. Council Member Addis, any questions? I don't have any questions, but I do want to say thank you because typically this comes before us and we haven't had this level of detail before, and so um, super helpful. And Mayor, your questions were very helpful, I think, to clarify a lot of the background to this that um, we just haven't discussed in, in public, maybe as long as I've been on council at least. So thank you for that. Okay. Councilmember Barton, questions? I don't have any questions either, but I also wanted to thank you for more in-depth information than we had before. So thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Heller, sir. Thank you, Mayor. To follow up on your comments, will staff be looking into how the uh, direction that the, that the council gave on May 24, 2004 was documented or what the, I think that's a good so, question that so we need we, to get answered unless someone knows. It was by resolution. Okay. It's my only question. Thank you. May I, I'm sorry, Mayor, may I interject? Uh, just you may briefly? interject anytime. I, I, I just wanna make sure I'm, I'm giving the whole picture and I, I may have been remiss that um, the, the, the Cloisters District also, you know, it, it has Cloisters Park, and, and that does serve as a, as a public park um, that's open to, to anyone. Um, and as well, the, the, the st storm water, um, so that pond serves as a stormwater basin. It doesn't look like it. It, it looks like, a, you know, kind of a nice feature for the park, which, which it is. Um, but that captures the stormwater off of Highway 1 and um, from stormwater coming up from North Morro Bay. Um, so if we go into that dredging project, uh, we would do so in the eye of it being um, not a beautification project, but some sort of um, stormwater project that, that impacts uh, parts of the city that, that are not in the cloisters. I just wanted to call that out. I appreciate that. That's a significant clarification, and um, I'm glad you did that, Greg. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and open up public comment. Uh, this is public comment for item C-1 on our agenda this evening. And I'll start with um, a speaker slip, Ms. Dawn Beatty. Welcome, Dawn. Surprise, surprise. Greetings, Mr. Mayor, City Council Member, staff, people watching from home. My name is Dawn Beatty, and I live in Morro Bay and in the cloisters. I want to thank city staff 
for acknowledging the, the, that the CD takes its share in the financing of the maintenance of the closest park and open space. As you indicated, there are many people using the park. Since last week, there have been buses bringing in children and people from Rosedale. They're, they came back in 2004, I found pictures from then, and they were back again this last week, so anyway. As I've said annually for the last decade or so, it's not just homeowners who benefit from the park that we have solely paid for. Back in 2004, the city began subsidizing costs that were greater than the assessment district's revenue, as has been mentioned. Unfortunately, the city manager at that time created an IOU that the assessment district was supposed to pay back. In 2014, that IOU was overturned and the city returned the money to the assessment district. Since that May 2004 ruling is being pointed to as a direction for this latest decision, I would like assurance that what happened then doesn't happen again. I also wish to offer my support of staff's recommendation to adopt resolution 4122. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, public comment is still open. Any other members of the public wishing to come forward, please do so now. Seeing none, um, I don't know who to ask. Do we have any, anybody on the phone, uh, AGP, for public comment? Uh, there are no hands raised. Thank you very much, appreciate that. We will close public comment, bring it back to council. And um, perhaps I could, I could just begin by, by summarizing. Um, I'll be supporting um, this item this evening. Um, however, I do have concerns that I've raised on a number of occasions, and those are um, the potential, um, um, not depletion, but a significant reduction in general fund due to the, um, my word, subsidization of uh, the lack of assessment being able to keep up with um, inflation um, over a long number of years. I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned that without limits that there may be problems in the future. Um, I know the agenda item is, is not this tonight, so it, uh, when I get to future agenda items, I'll be bringing this up and looking for maybe further information for us to get a handle on that, but I will be supporting it this evening. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Yeah, Councilmember. Yeah, I, sure. I support what you're saying, Mayor. I think this is something that we need to resolve um, because obviously it's uh, the subsidization of the uh, assessment district is only going to grow from the general fund. So I look forward to your future agenda item. Thanks. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Oh, oh yeah. I would just like to say that um, <laughs> I. Uh, I appreciate the comments from Ms. Beatty um, on the fact that you know it is a park that we all use within our city um, for various events and tourists as well. And um, I will be supporting this resolution. Um, I think it's important that we do so. Thank you, Councilmember Ford. Any other comments? If not, then I will. Um uh, recommend that we adopt resolution 41-22 declaring the intent to levy the annual assessment for the maintenance of the Cloisters Park and open space for fiscal year 22-23 and approving the engineer's report. I'll second. F seconded by Councilmember Barton. Motion by Mayor Heading. Any further conversation? Discussion? None? All right. We'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Councilmember Addis? Yes. Councilmember Ford? Yes. Councilmember Heller? Yes. Councilmember Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. That completes item C 1. Brings us to item C 2. This is adoption of resolution number 42 22, approving the engineer's report and declaring the intent to levy the annual assessment for the North Point uh, Natural Area Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District. You're up again, Mr. Kowalik. It's your night tonight. Apparently it is. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Please it is too. Public Works Week. <laughs> I mean, yes, it is. So coming up. I'm feeling it. Um, so um, 
Very similarly, um, I'll do a very short presentation, even shorter than the Cloisters presentation, and um, if there are any technical questions or questions about the engineer's report, we do have city engineer Eric Ridio available for questions. So um, the North Point Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District was established in 1996. Um, this one uh, gets uh, far less revenue than, than the Cloisters District. We only receive $5,645 a year. Um, there's only 10 parcels that pay into it, and they're paying $564.50 uh, annually. And again, there is no CPI escalator um, on that revenue or on that assessment. So um, costs have gone up since 1996 in the same way as they have um, for uh, the, the cost to maintain the Cloisters District. Um, and we do continue to uh, maintain that at, at, at the same level uh, of effort. And so this, uh, this assessment district is different than the Cloisters in that there is no accumulation fund. So the city has not historically been putting aside 10%. There is no fund of money for capital projects. Actually, the, the intention um, in, in our budget proposal will be that this uh, fund will have a zero balance at the end of the year. So essentially, we spend through the fund every year. Um, our, maintenance ta our maintenance tasks uh, at North Point include landscaping and irrigation, graffiti and, lit, um, and excuse me, litter removal and tree trimming. Um, and that's really my short summary. Uh, continuation of this assessment does require city council to approve annually the city engineer's report uh, and declare the intent to levy the annual assessment. So uh, I'm available for questions as is our city engineer. Appreciate that. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Councilmember Ford, yes, please. Um, thank you, Mayor. So, Mr. Qualick, I have a question about, um, you said there's it typically, you know, it ends with a zero balance. And so is there any maintenance that is not being done because of your limited amount of money? Or is it plenty and it's getting the job done? The challenge to answering that question is that we don't measure um, hours worked, staff hours worked at that site. Um, I am sure that our level of maintenance effort um, costs more um, than the five or, or the $5,600. I'm, I'm sure of that, but I, I could not give you a hard number. Um, the, the way our, um, our kind of payroll works in, in the background is employees are, are allocated to certain funds at different percentages. Um, and so, in, in our case now, I, I believe in the upcoming fiscal year budget, we are not allocating anyone's time at all uh, to uh, maintaining the North Point Assessment District. Um, it's just if, if there's uh, utility payments that we have to make there, um, services and supplies. Um, so we're not allocating any staff time at all to be funded through this assessment district. Nevertheless, our, we're, we're there all the time maintaining it. So. Um, this is another example of, um, again, costs going up, revenue staying the same, uh, but I wouldn't be able to tell you how much. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Council Member Edis, any questions? I don't have any questions because this one is so standard and comes every year, so thank you. Thank you. I have no questions. Council Member Barton? Uh, I have no questions either. And Council Member Hiller, sir. Yes, yeah, so if this comes before Council again, will you be able to tell us the costs uh, for maintaining North Point? With the way our system is currently set up, no, because that, that would, we would have to change how we track staff time. Um, so, you know, in theory, it, it could be done. We, we could have a, a, a workaround where anytime staff person's there, uh, you know, we could track it on a separate spreadsheet and um, and then calculate it monthly or, or something like that, and maybe get a get a good estimate. Um, but uh, we don't currently have a way of, of measuring that to the dollar. Uh, the other question I have is, I mean, I've been out there a few times. It doesn't seem like there's a lot to maintain, but maybe I'm missing something. Uh, it, there's no park that's used heavily by public from outside the area. It's kind of a little secret spot, really. Um, you mentioned a number of things that you do there. Could you give me a little more detail what you do in terms of maintenance? Sure, there's some light landscaping that's done there. Um, 
I've, I've seen our crews up there doing that work. Um, there is occasionally graffiti there that, that, we're, that we show up to remove. Um, I believe there's lighting there um, because it, it, it is a lighting maintenance assessment district. So there is lighting there. And so there's a, a utility bill that comes that has to be paid um, through this revenue uh, source. Uh, and there is irrigation there as well. So that means we're also paying for water. OK. Those are my questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-2 on the agenda. Any member of the public wishing to come forward, please do so now. And welcome, Betty. Betty Winholtz. Um, this is uh, kind of a uh, trailhead for where people go down to the dog beach, so I'm pretty familiar. I go there frequently. And for those of you on the council who don't, um, the North Point uh, parking lot and the area, grassy area around it, is basically an open space. It was never intended to be kept up as a park. It, it's just as a natural area, and it's labeled that way as a natural area. Where our dollars go, or where the people who pay for those dollars uh, go, is along the strip between the street and the parking lot. Uh, that's where the lighting is. That's where the watering is done. So the public, in essence, re really receives no benefit. The people who live there receive the across-the-street benefit of their trees being trimmed. And my guess is that a lot of the money probably goes to the utility of the electrical uh, cost. I know there was a light put in, finally, um, in the park. Um, but I, I think it's important to know that at least as a lay person, I have, uh, or if I was paying into the assessment district, I would have a problem if I didn't know how my money was being spent or how um, the staff was spending their time there. And so I think it would behoove us to both assessment districts to be able to articulate those to the council so they know whether they need more money from these people or not. Thanks. Thank you, Betty. Public comment is still open regarding item C-2. Any member of the public wishing to come forward, please do so now. Seeing none, um, do we have any calls, AGP? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have no raised hands in the queue. And thank you for that. I'll go ahead and close public comment, bring it back for either a motion or further discussion. Okay, I will go ahead and move approval um, or ad adoption of resolution number 42-22, approving the engineer's report and declaring the intent to levy the annual assessment of the North Point Natural Area Landscaping and Lighting Maintenance Assessment District. I'll second. <laughs> Ooh, I was gonna die for a second. Motion by uh, Mayor Heading, second by Council Member Heller for the staff recommendation. Any further discussion? Yeah, I have another. Uh, Absolutely. I think, uh, I think it would be good uh, when this does come back, if it comes back, that we have some cost information about, uh, even if it's a spreadsheet, if it's not too burdensome, I think we do need to look at that. So, thanks. Thank you. Other comments? We'll do a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Ford? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. That ends item C-2, brings us to item C-3. This um, is in Mayor, yes. um, I oh, actually thank you. need to recu uh, recuse myself from this item um, due to my personal business arrangement. That could be a conflict of interest. So I'm going to remove myself. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ford. You are recused. Um, this is item C-3, introduction of ordinance number 652, allowing smoking receptacles within the city right-of-way. Mr. Qualick, you are back. <laughs> My thank goodness. You, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, pleased to provide a verbal presentation about this item. Uh, this is something we're pretty excited about. Um, there are a lot of cigarette butts um, out there on Morro Bay streets, sidewalks, gutters, roadways, open space, parks. Etc. There are a lot of dedicated volunteers. I, I don't see any of them that, that came in uh, today, but that are out there on the weekends and during the week um, picking up cigarette butts. Um, I've spent some time with those folks, and they are—they, I really appreciate their efforts. Um, 
And it's uh, pretty interesting because we have all these cigarette butts, yet um, chapter 9.24 of our municipal code prohibits uh, smoking in public places. Uh, and so this is, this is a problem that all cities on the Central Coast um, are feeling. Um, it's not really c clear how to handle this situation. It's hard to catch someone throwing a cigarette on the ground. It's very difficult to enforce. There are challenges there. Um, and uh, cigarette butts are polluters. Um, they put toxins into the ground after it rains. Um, they're unsightly. Um, and there's just a lot of reasons to not, to not want them around. Um, and the difficulty of our ordinance is that we cannot put up cigarette receptacles um, because I, I suppose that that might encourage smoking or may give the wrong idea that, that smoking um, is permitted in the city. We were recently approached um, from tobacco control at Slow County uh, with an idea to place uh, receptacles paid for by the county um, around the Embarcadero and the Rock parking lot area. I believe uh, they've offered us five of them. Um, and uh, we were very interested in this because we thought it could mitigate um, some of the impacts of, of, of these cigarette butts on the ground, uh, but then learned that our ordinance prevent, would prevent us from putting them up. So uh, this ordinance change would essentially um, allow me, the public works director, or any future public works director, um, at his or her discretion to place cigarette receptacles um, in some public places. Uh, and so what we're asking for tonight is um, the introduction of the ordinance and, and for council to, uh, well, to simply uh, introduce the ordinance to uh, allow the public works director to do that. I'd just like to say a few things. We do have um, Amy from LA County. Thank you for sticking it out, Amy, um, from County uh, Tobacco Control. We also have Derek Hansen here who put this report together and did the research um, with, with the support of the city attorney's office. He's our new engineering tech uh, in public works department. So thank you, Eric. I'm sorry, Derek. And for your viewing uh, pleasure is a stainless steel uh, cigarette receptacle that, and this is what we would be putting up. So um, that that is my presentation. I'm available for questions. Derek is available for questions. and. I believe Amy is going to want to come up and say a few words. Do you, can I allow Amy to do that now, or do you, is, is that a comment? Would that be a public comment? There are no if, ands, or buts about it. She may come now. <laughs> come, come on down, Amy. Come on down, Amy. <laughs> it's getting late, folks. <laughs> we had a long delay. Sorry. Welcome, Amy. Yes, thank you all very much. Um, good evening, Mayor, uh, Council members staff and community members. Um, my name is Amy Gilman. I am the Tobacco Control Program Manager. We're a program that's housed within the County Department of Public Health. And um, it really is my pleasure to be here. Um, the beautiful receptacle that um, uh, Mr. Qualick was, was demonstrating uh, for the, the verbal description is it looks like a, a, a long a two foot cylinder say that would attach to a post or an existing pole and actually serve specifically to capture uh, cigarette butts. We do believe that electronic devices could slide in there as well, but they'd have to be fairly short to round that, that opening. They do have these very beautiful, in my opinion, um, stickers that are on them. Um, to create this product, we actually partnered with your um, let me get the right word. Um, the Central Coast Partners for Water Quality Central Coast Clean social media campaign. So we joined that program just to be able to help develop this and to create um, tobacco specific social messaging that will, um, if you recall from that program, uh, it is social messaging and digital ads that populate cell phones when people are in particular geographic areas. So if a tourist comes here, they could get your, uh, the advertisement that says, don't drop your cigarette butts in, in Morro Bay, basically. Um, so um, our tagline on that um, campaign is, the world is your oyster, not your ashtray. Uh, we actually did um, a small uh, consumer testing to, to and uh, landed on that particular messaging, which apparently is, is being well received. Um, uh, I, the analytics are, are showing it's, it's trending well. 
Um, we also have on that um, uh, sticker the, um, an advertisement for the state's free quit service. This is a state provided quit service for those who would like to quit any form of uh, tobacco use. Um, and uh, they offer that program, I'm going to promote it, uh, they offer that program for free in uh, six languages, and they offer it via telephone service, text service, and there is even an app to help you with your quit process. Um, so that's what I would like to say about that. Um, we definitely wanted to add the, the promotion of the quit service because as we know, the waste is simply the end product. And yes, that tobacco waste does not break down. It simply dissolves and becomes part of your uh, microplastic biome that's out there infiltrating everything. So um, in order to ultimately stop that waste, we need to help people quit the habit of nicotine. So. Um, I'm glad we could be a partner, and if we could help going forward, we're certainly happy to do so. Thank you, Amy. And um, the county tobacco control agency has been a good partner and a great partner with Morro Bay and uh, a number of changes to our ordinances in the past. And we just want to thank you and appreciate the work that you do as well and your assistance with this project. You, you're very welcome. You do have a marvelous ordinance, and it was, uh, and I know the one ordinance that we're seeking to change was actually done there on an ideal model. Uh, unfortunately, um, the necessity to assist your the quality of your waterways um, kind of trumped that. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll open it up to council member questions. Uh, council member Addis, any questions? No, I don't, but thank you so much uh, for the dual partnership, the dual effort. Very much appreciated. Council Member uh, Barton, any questions? Um, <clears throat> just a comment. I'm uh, intrigued to hear about the California Quit Service. That sounds like a really productive um, possibility. Um, sorry, I stepped away there for a moment. Uh, yes, it, it re really is. Um, I don't know if you knew in the past, traditionally, the county tried to support uh, group therapy for quit services, but the need is so large now, and the language needs are, are l much larger than we're able to handle at the moment, and so we're mm -hmm. really working to increase uh, referrals to this, this free service um, and, and help more people. Uh, the service actually, um, they're reaching down to age 13 these days through the state program. So is that... Um, is that active in all counties? All yes, over the state? yes, it okay. is. Yeah, great. Yes, it is. Thank you. Councilmember Hiller. Yes, I think, Greg, you mentioned you were going to monitor these, put them in certain locations where you have a lot of cigarette butts and then track how much, how effective it is. Is that, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so thank you for asking that question. That's a key part of the partnership is that uh, we will be tracking uh, weekly how many cigarette butts by volume. Uh, go into these receptacles, and uh, depending on the success, um, and success means a lot of cigarettes in the receptacle, depending on that success, uh, the program may expand at the county. We may be able to potentially get more receptacles in the future, um, and they may be able to expand this farther out in other parts of the county as well. So we, we would be very pleased to be a, a part of that program. And what areas specifically uh, are your where, you, where, you, where do you expect to put these in? Where, where are the worst areas in terms of cigarette butts? <clears throat> yeah, so certainly the uh, Embarcadero, um, Target Rock area, uh, Mora Rock parking lot um, are the areas that I've personally seen and uh, have a lot of cigarette butts on the ground. Uh, and in talking with folks who volunteer and go around and pick these things up, those are the hot spots. It's, it's very common for visitors um, and possibly some residents to come and see um, our, our beautiful landscape and stop and enjoy a cigarette and then throw it right on the ground in that you know, beautiful area. So unfortunately, those, those uh, resources that we have are, are usually the, the areas that um, see a, a lot of cigarette butts on the ground. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Appreciate it very much. With that, I'll open up public comment for item C-3. Uh, public comment's now open. Any member of the public wishing to speak on this, come forward. Betty, welcome back. 
Betty Winholtz, not a big item for me, but I, I do know that along, since you mentioned along the Embarcadero and out to the rock is where we have the buckets, which says park your butt here. Will those buckets disappear and these will be taking their place? So how will those two programs interface? Thanks, Greg, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I appreciate you, uh, Ms. Winholtz, for bringing that up. So as I understand it, those buckets are a community effort and so um, we certainly wouldn't wanna put one of these new receptacles right next to one of those buckets. Um, we would, we'd wanna space them out so we get greater coverage. Um, and we have no intention of removing those buckets. So uh, we think that the two programs can coexist. Thank you. Okay, um, any uh, calls for public comment, AGP? We have no raised hands in the queue. Great, thank you. We'll close public comment, bring it back to council entertain a motion or further discussion. I'll move to approve this item. Okay. I'll go ahead and second. It's a motion by Council Member Addis, second by Mayor Heading for introduction of ordinance number 652 allowing smoking receptacles within the city right of way. Um, any further discussion? Yes, Council Member Hiller. Yeah, Greg, so I don't know if you're working with Moral Bay Beautiful, but they're the owners of those buckets and uh, Maybe you can coordinate the locations with them. Uh, just a thought. Thanks. Good thought. Thanks. Further discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and ask for a roll call vote, please. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member Barton? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 401. <coughs> Great. And Derek, thank you for your work on this. Appreciate you being here late tonight. I know Qualic gets a lot of the credit, but. You deserve more. I do appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks. And that brings us to item C-4. Um, I'll just check in with my peers. Um, do we need a biofluid break or did you want to continue? Yes, I see at least one head nodding. That means that we will go ahead and take a three minute break or so and be back. I uh, have 8.04, see you at 8.07 or 8.00.
Got the igloo jacket on. It did get cold here, didn't it? back that brings us uh, welcome back I don't know if we're on I don't think we're on TV but in case we are uh, welcome back um, we are on item C-4 this is city council goals and action items update and with that I'm going to turn it over to not Mr. Qualick but Mr. Collins yes thank you yeah he has to rest his voice um, Scott Collins city manager thank you mayor and council members um, I'm going to give a presentation on the kind of where we're at with the action items related to city council goals. It's just a quick reminder, council adopted um, the city goals for all of the remainder of 2021 at that time, 2022 and into early 2023, and um, also 35 related short-term action items to help achieve those goals. Um, just as a reminder, those five city goals are to improve public infrastructure, achieve fiscal sustainability and economic vitality, address housing needs, climate action, and improve community health. Um, as I mentioned, there's 35 action items that were identified to help kind of move forward those goals, um, re recognizing that you're never going to ever achieve those. You're always going to have needs that you're going to be working on in those areas. And of course, we do this on a two-year cycle, review the goals to make sure we're uh, keeping up with the needs of our community and use surveys and community forums and other methods. Uh, including advisory board meetings and committee meetings to get input from the community to shape those goals. Um, so again, those are the five goals that we're working towards, 35 action items. I'm going to cover the 28 action items that are currently underway of those 35 um, by each of the goal areas. So under improved public infrastructure, um, conduct a traffic speed survey. Staff will be requesting funding for traffic speed survey through the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Um, next one is to initiate a capital assessment effort. City staff will be requesting funding to conduct a capital assessment for the harbor, as well as other areas of uh, capital areas of the city through the fiscal year 22-23 budget. Review options and develop optimal staffing for city maintenance efforts. Um, council did approve staffing enhancements in the mid-year budget process for this year. Uh, initiate work on a paid parking pilot program and continue work on a long-term plan. So we have Walker Consultants who did the first phase are now under contract for the next phase of the pilot project. Um, we'll be seeking information from, um, or input I should say from the parking stakeholder group and likely bring forward a plan to council in the fall of this year. Pursue funding or grant opportunities for Coleman Beach area. Uh, council's already authorized submission of several grants through the California State Prop 68 for improvements to Coleman Beach. Area and we're looking for other funding opportunities. Under achieve fiscal sustainability and economic vitality, uh, first one is to seek state lobbyist contract to assist in obtaining st state funding for city projects. Um, council approved a contract with Townsend Public Affairs. Um, we, and we also have a federal lobbyist contract with the Ferguson Group. Next is assess viability for business improvement districts for downtown Embarcadero. We're currently partnered with the Chamber doing a survey of business owners in that area and employees. Hopefully I have information um, from that effort to bring forward to um, those groups as well as city council in the near future. Review development opportunities for Market Plaza property. Uh, the city recently completed its notice of availability timeframe with regard to the state's surplus land act, AB 1486, and can now pursue redevelopment opportunities on that site. Complete a fee study, in particular development impact fees. So city staff is in the process of completing review of the draft study and will present to the council this summer and also uh, consult with the chamber on that. Um, continue review of Vistra proposed battery project. You heard an update from Vistra representatives this evening and they have submitted a project that will going through a pretty robust review, um, uh, particularly on the EIR side and, and through the staff in the planning department. Um, assess cybersecurity needs. Uh, city staff has conducted an assessment, has already made and implemented improvements, um, which we will not state what those are, obviously, but um, definitely are working on that and continue to assess the needs on an ongoing basis given um, what the state of affairs are with, on, on cyber. So it's, a, it's an ever-evolving field. Prepare and review policy options on liabilities. 
Um, so City Council already moved forward with the creation of a 115 trust fund, and we're currently in that process, um, which will include a member of council, two members of council, a member of CFAC, and staff in our um, financial advisors. And we'll bring back consideration um, next fiscal year. Under address housing needs, uh, complete a zoning code update. Staff is currently working on the final touches with Coastal Commission staff. Hopefully bring forward something to Planning Commission this summer and Council later this summer or fall. Develop stock accessory dwelling unit templates to provide to the public for free. And staff is working with our county partners to finalize those ADU templates. Anticipate work complete in June of 2022. Provide an update to City Council on new state housing legislation such as Senate Bill 9 and general education on housing. It's already been done, uh, but, but will be ongoing, obviously. Implement housing element. Staff's working to develop and finalize core components of the housing element, including an inclusionary housing ordinance, objective design standards, and density bonus. And I'll likely bring this to Council in the summer or fall. CSEL State land use amendment regarding density. So City staff will be presenting to Planning Commission in June on that as well as City Council this summer. Complete City Works online plan check application. Staff has implemented the online application is in the testing the system, correct? Yeah. And hopefully we'll finalize that later this year. And initiate work with the Planning Commission Ad Hoc Committee for review of the planning process. The committee is formed and we'll begin meeting once the City Works uh, online plan check is fully implemented. Under the next goal of climate action, pursue electronic electric, sorry, vehicle charging station funding. We do have a grant that we're already been awarded and we're working to finalize the, the remaining portions of the funding to look to place four EV charging parking stations, Greg? Is that right? Is it six? I'm sorry, can you repeat How that? How many question? EV charging uh, parking stations? On the Embarcadero? Six. Six, yes. So working on that, implement or initiate implementation of Senate Bill 1383, and you heard from uh, Public Works uh, Director Greg Falk earlier this evening um, that the garbage company, Amora Bay Garbage, will be seeking rate increases to help implement Senate Bill 1383 and also pass through the Integrated Waste Management Authority, or IWA's um, uh, resulting uh, expenses related to Senate Bill 1383. But all this is in good you know, to, to help reduce our, our waste streams and improve uh, organic composting and other greening of, of basically our trash. And so th these are very important efforts, but they are, they are requiring a lot of coordination across the, the county and um, the city's been a major player in that and Councilmember Heller's been representing the city on the IWMA board, um, but it looks like we're getting a lot closer to implementation, but there's a lot of steps involved. Uh, promote Central Coast Community Energy, or 3CE, New Construction Electrification Program. So city staff is developing a climate action webpage where this information will reside, which should be online this summer. Create a city webpage with links to energy efficient websites. That same website will have that information this summer. Elevate climate crisis to a climate emergency by way of resolution and seek funding to move forward in this area. The council approved a resolution to that effect this February. Implement 3CE reach code incentive program for new residential development. City staff is working with the Tri-County Energy Network to develop uh, a reach code related electrification and new residential development. Um, this group is developing background material for preparation of a draft code that will be brought forward as part of the adoption of the 22 building code and to city council later this winter. Uh, the last goal is to improve community health um, we continue to support Slow County in efforts to vaccinate members of the, the community. Um, and inform the county process to update the 10 year plan on homelessness. I sit on the, uh, represent the city managers on a steering committee for the entire county to update that plan. Um, the county has the five, five members of the board who typically don't agree on anything, agreed 5 0 to fund. Uh, positions, fund a specific division related to homelessness, and to empower staff, uh, their, their staff, and create a more cohesive plan across all the cities and nonprofits to really tackle this issue. Um, not going to eliminate it, like all the plans used to say, but to truly make a dent and reduce homelessness and that all cities would participate uh, in that effort. Uh, last is support Filipino American group 
rededication of in of their historic monument at Coleman Beach. Um, Public Works staff is working with that, the group on their event for this October. So those are the 28 action items that we have made some movement on. Some have completed, some are very initial, some are midway through, and there's several that we still haven't gotten to yet. Um, but I would say that's pretty good progress since November of 2021 when these are all put in place. And um, just a, a note of caution, of course, is organizational capacity. I think we're pretty much running on um, full power and it, it's anything more would be a bit much, but these are important um, efforts that we're tackling in addition to the, the regular work of the city organization. So uh, we do appreciate um, council support of that and acknowledgement of that, of course. And um, we want to keep continue working to achieve these ambitious goals and work plans. So with that, I'll turn it over to any questions that council may have. Hey, thank you, Scott. Um, I know we say it every time, but it's always amazing when we have it in front of us, the amount of work that's being done and the amount of um, action items that we've made great progress on. So I want to not only thank you, but I want to thank the complete staff for all of the work that they've done to make this happen. And we, uh, we appreciate it greatly. We're, I know we're almost at the end line, but man, tremendous project. Uh, progress and um, um, thank you guys so much. Uh, any questions for Mr. Collins on the goal report? Council Member Ford, any questions? Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question for you, Scott. Um, when you're talking about the 10-year plan for homelessness, can you give me an idea of where you are on that as far as the completion of that plan, like how far out we are <coughs> before we yeah. see something? Good question. I, I'm hoping that I can bring the, um, the county staff to, to a council meeting in the near future to, to kind of give a broad update on what the Board of Supervisors approved and provided direction to the county staff on related to this. But um, we're getting pretty close to getting ready to deliver a report to the Board of Supervisors. Um, in fact, there's an all-day session this Friday to really try to bring all the pieces together. Um, the county did invest in a, a consultant group who specializes in creating these plans. They've been fantastic. Um, Susan Funk is the um, council representative for all council members across the, the, the cities, and she's been phenomenal. I, I don't know how she finds time to do this, but she's been driving this. And the county has a dedicated um, individual for homelessness, uh, Joe, and I can't pronounce his last name, but he's retired military, and um, he's quite something. So a, a lot of great folks working on this and the nonprofits are at the table and an individual who's experienced homelessness in our county. Um, so a really w thoughtful uh, approach. And so I'm hoping that we can have something to deliver to, to the councils. Um, at least here's the plan. And then there's a thoughtful approach, a five-year kind of runway, uh, a first sort of how do we create a better countywide system and then the implementation that comes after looking at um, we're housing people where they're at, you know, some things that, you know, you're going to need to it, literally on the ground, whether it's safe parking or sanctioned camps sites to, um, things like the Grover beach are trying like the, 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 tiny homes and, and other, other methodologies because just the cost of land is so expensive and building anything is it's like a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars per unit. So that's not sustainable with the numbers of homeless folks we have. So. It'll be a, truly a five-year plan, um, but one I think will be implementable. So hopefully in the next several months, we'll have information to share with council. Well, thank you, that was a very well, <laughs> you <laughs> dove deep into that answer, so I appreciate that. That was, yeah. you went above and beyond what I was asking, so thank you. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that come across because um, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, I know that it's one of the most common questions that comes across to me um, just at the grocery store, you know, and talking to random people is, is what, what's happening with our unhoused um, population here. So um, that, was, that was a standout for me, but um, that's the only question I have regarding um, these goals. I just, I, I, I guess I'll save my comments for later. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's my only question, thank you. Council Member Addis, any questions? Yeah, Scott, you um, hit on something I think is really important, but I was wondering if you could explain just a tiny bit more. You said housing people where they are at, and if you could just kind of illuminate a little bit what what's meant by that and why would we, as part of our 10-year plan, be looking at that closely? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of uh, evolution of where an individual's at, you know, whatever issues they have that they're experiencing and in building trust with service providers. Um, you know, sometimes it takes 20 or 30 touches before somebody will, will trust an outreach worker or they will take services. You know, often here, the, the adage is that well, the people are rejecting services, and that they, they all get cast under that umbrella. And it's like, well, they, they just refuse help. And it's like, well, they don't trust you yet. So, I think that's part of the, the plan is to understand that there's an evolution with folks who, some have been on the street for for decades, and that you're not going to be able to house them overnight. So there's kind of interim steps. And some people just don't want to be housed in. Um, an adjoining facility where there's lots of people around because they may have mental health issues that doesn't doesn't make that work. So we have to think about that in space as well. And there's also carve outs for diversity, equity, inclusion in this um, effort as well as people with special needs. So that's that's kind of what I meant by that. Yeah. Uh, this is from Mr. Qualick. <clears throat> with regard to your comment on the <clears throat> Excuse me. The electric chargers. Um, do we have a timeline on when we might be implementing those? And I'll, I'll tell you why I ask is that you know, with obviously the high prices of gases, people are trying to get electric cars, but they're not available. But I see this pent up demand that's going to be out there, and I'm just wondering where we stand on timeline. That's a great question. Thank you, Mayor. Our timeline currently is uh, limited by PG&E, so we are, we are done with design on our side, and it's been submitted to PG&E, and PG&E is now reviewing it. Um, uh, from what I understand, we didn't, we didn't know that that was a step that we would have to take, or at least into the, into the level of detail that they're going, and it, it could take from six to nine months for them to review that. Hopefully it doesn't take that long. Um, but but that, that is the phase we're in. I, I should also mention that we are working on an EV project, um, an EV charger project at, at Del Mar Park as well. So uh, we did work with a company to apply for a Cal EVIP grant, um, and their original design was putting five chargers up at Del Mar Park to take advantage of the proximity of the church and the, and the uh, school right there, uh, as well as folks who are visitors to that park. Uh, and that's currently something that we're still working with um, uh, uh, a, 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 a company for. I should note that uh, that company now has concerns that it, it may not uh, it may not turn a profit for them to even work on the project. But uh, we, we we're working with them, and we're hopeful that that project comes through. And, and also, the Atascadero Road Hotel has how many? We'll be putting in how many? I'm trying to remember, Scott Graham. Uh, nine, and nine. I think we have another four going in uh, in the parking lot in front of McDonald's. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Councilmember Barton, any questions? Um, I, d I just wanted to um, thank uh, the city manager for reporting on this list because it's such a long list. It kind of, you know, it, it has a way of floating, and it's nice to see it all in one place and hear the updates. So thank you very much. Councilmember Heller. Uh, thank you. With respect to the housing element, I was looking at it before the meeting, and I think we all talk about affordable housing and workforce housing, and yet in looking at the numbers, we're really not providing that housing for extremely low, uh, very low or low income groups. Uh, the low income groups, to a certain extent, are met through ADUs, but there's no real management of what those ADUs rent for, so I'm not so sure that those really, even though the state considers them uh, as part of the calculation, I'm not sure that those are really affordable uh, to uh, the low-income folks. Um, I guess the question is, is there some way, a lot of cities have uh, allow small units like an ADU um, it, with density bonuses, height variances and so forth, uh, public benefits, so that affordable, really affordable units that can be purchased by people at an entry level are available. Is there any chance, or is there any way we can make this housing element work in that way so that um, smaller housing units can actually be purchased as opposed to rented? Yeah, it's a great question, Councilmember Heller. I, um, beyond the uh, you know the low, low, the 
high, low cost or uh, low income affordable project being built by Highway 411. I mean, that's the first one that comes to mind. I mean, that's actually being developed now, but um, Scott Graham probably has an idea of where some of these things like the, the density bonus and um, the inclusionary housing ordinance and things like that may be able to deliver actual units. Um, so I'd probably turn to Scott and see how, you know, what this might materialize in terms of number of units or, or what shape that would look like. Yeah, I mean, we're in the process of developing that policy. We have a consultant working with us right now. Um, our design group is working with us um, on it. Uh, we're uh, pushing out the density bonus to other types of development, not just related to housing, but also the impacts that commercial development has on housing. We build more commercial. They need employees, these employees need places to live, and so we're sort of making that sort of connection between the, the commercial development that we have in the city and, and housing. Um, so that will probably, you know, result in us getting more housing, you know, on that type, on that side of things. But the things that we have in the pipeline right now, the um, the item that, that Scott mentioned um, over at Seashell Estates, where we're looking at zoning that property to um, probably accommodate uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 70 residential units. Those are probably going to be mostly um, apartment type units. Um, the surrounding property owner that's along that that owns a majority of the site around there, around Casa de Flores, um, as well as the Lady on Yard for the work project, they own that area. We lease it from them. Um, is also looking to do something along these lines, um, really more for for sale units as opposed to um, actual um, uh, as, as opposed to rental units. And so um, portions of those projects will be um, affordable. Um, based on our affordable uh, housing requirements. So at least 10% of them will be uh, affordable. So it sounds projects. like there's some hope for actually having units for sale that would be affordable. Uh, uh, yes, yes, Councilmember. I mean, it, 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 one of those ranges. The reason I ask is in looking at the census information and the housing element, apparently 40% of the residents here live alone. So, I mean, if I were living alone, I'd be more than happy to live in 400 or 600 or 700 square feet and, and own it. Uh, and I just want to make sure that those options, that we look at those options and what kinds of accommodations we would have to, to make to make to, to make that work. Do you, do you think it's feasible in, in, in any so, way? So, so folks, can, folks can build whatever size, you know, can build smaller homes. Um, we are looking at putting a premium on larger homes so we could get in Luffy's to come in and we could use that to offset costs. Um, of uh, providing affordable housing. So uh, houses, uh, the, the cutoff that we're looking at right now is 2,500 square feet and above. And you would pay a higher amount of like, housing impact fee as it relates to that. So we can help um, you know, offset, again, some of the costs of housing. Uh, and then we're also looking at increasing the percentage um, of, for projects. We have the um, uh, Panorama 61 lot subdivision up there. Uh, currently 10% of those would be uh, required to be affordable. Um, we have the uh, Chevron slash Texaco property that's uh, also on North Main. Um, that could accommodate upwards of 200 units. Um, it's high density residential. Um, the folks that have been looking at purchasing that property have been, you know, have looked at doing a mixed project um, where some units are uh, rental apartment type units and others are condo type units, which is the type of housing you have to put there, one of those two, because it's high density. Um, so those are some of the, you know, at least, you know, uh, concepts or, or projects that could be coming down the road that would have, um, you know, units like that in them, and then, then they would have, a, again, a percentage of those units, upwards of um, 20, if, if we increase it even more than that, um, affordable housing units. And then when you say affordable, that refers primarily to the low classification, which you have to have 80% of median income? Low, moderate, or very is low. Or moderate? Could, oh, because sorry. moderate's 120% of median. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's um, okay. Um, yeah, no, we would be, the city gets to dictate um, what the units come in at. You also want to do it in a manner when you're working with the folks that are developing the projects, so we're not making things, you know, uh, infeasible for them to develop the projects. But um, yeah, we would be able to, through the discretionary permitting process, identify what those um, units would come in at. Okay. So it's not just moderate. Right. Okay. Um, that answers my questions for that section. Climate action, the vehicle charging station. It's my understanding that really the bottleneck for more electric vehicles is the infrastructure, not just in Morro Bay, but 
along the major freeways and highways and so forth. I was bold enough to ask uh, Vistra when they gave me the tour of the plant to provide 50 EV charging stations at no cost to the city and uh, uh, support that with uh, renewable energy. So I don't know if that will come to pass, but uh, I think we need to ramp up, as, uh, not only to your point, what the timeline is, but, but maybe greatly increase the number that we're thinking about because the, the demand is certainly there, and I think the, the, uh, the bottleneck will be the charging station. So uh, that's my comment on that. Regarding SB 1383, to follow up on Director Qualick's comments, yes, there will be a rate increase coming. Uh, to support this unfunded man mandate from Sacramento. Uh, I support the intent of the mandate, which is we divert organic waste, meaning all your yard clippings and food waste, away from the landfill. And the simplest way for us to do that as individuals is to no longer use our garbage disposals, which I know is antithetical or anti-intuitive or disintuitive, whatever the right word is, counterintuitive. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't use your garbage disposals anymore and collect your, your organic waste from food waste uh, and put it in the container, get it in the green container. For commercial uh, businesses, I believe if you generate two cubic yards or more in solid waste per month, that you have to have a green uh, waste can as well. So the cost right now is a little bit squishy, so the rate increases are going to happen. I represent the City of Morro Bay on the county board, the IWMA board. We are pushing hard to get the cost of com uh, compliance down, which is basically what you're paying the IWMA for, is to focus on compliance. Uh, the more we can comply on our own, the less the cost will be. And we want to focus on primarily the big commercial um, vendors on, on that. So that's kind of the announcement I wanted to make at the beginning, but I felt so badly that we had to wait so long because of the technical problems, I didn't make it. So uh, that's uh, those are my questions and comments. Thanks, Council Member Heller. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and open up public comment for item C-4, public comment is now open. Come on down, Betty. Thank you, Betty Winholtz again. Um, I have four comments. Um, one is regard to your goal on infrastructure, and um, I, I just want to raise the point uh, to you and to the public that that does not include any street repairs or anything for residential neighborhoods. The way that you scoped that uh, goal, infrastructure kind of makes people think, oh, you're taking care of us and our streets, and, and you're not. It's all focused on the Embarcadero, it's focused on things in the tourist area, and so I want to make that comment as a layperson that I object to that goal. Um, in terms of the zoning um, and the zoning code which is coming back, um, it, it used to be, and um, being old, that's how I think, that um, we as a community used to talk about the zoning ordinance and how it fit into our plan, and then it went to coastal. But so much these days, it's like staff visits with Coastal, then it comes back to the community and it's already in a sense a done deal. So I just wanna say I don't like that process, uh, the way it's uh, turned out. And then uh, two other comments regarding to the housing. For years, we've been trying to get a safe parking area in Morro Bay and somehow staff or whoever has always stopped that from either happening in um, Albertson's parking lot or the old uh, Williams Brother parking lot, but I'm not sure why we're waiting for um, the county's plan to do what we know we need to do and we haven't done, and I don't see that the council's helped that at all. And so you really need to move on in terms of developing us a safe parking spot. And then my final comment um, is actually a question finally instead of a criticism, um, and that is in terms of the EV stations, um, I know people pay for that, but like you were talking a little bit ago, who pays for that infrastructure? Is that falling back on our tax dollars? Is that something that you're getting grants for? Um, there's been at least three projects that have come through. Uh, the Planning Commission where the EV stations were left, left to the option of the developer as opposed to being mandated. So, and then the, some of those have come to you, and again, you have not mandated those. So I'm, I'm just, bringing that up so it can be in front of you to be a little bit more forthright. 
Thank you, Betty. Uh, public comment is still open for item C-4. Seeing no members of the public, um, do we have any AGP, any calls for C-4? Mayor, we have no raised hands in the queue. Okay, uh, I will close public comment and bring it back to council. Just Mr. Qualick, um, regarding, uh, well, maybe start with Mr. Graham, regarding the hotel, the new hotel, payment of the charging stations, the responsibility. Is, is, is the responsibility of the hotel. Right, exactly. It's the responsibility of the hotel. Um, and Mr. Qualick, um, with regard to the other stations you're considering? Yes, yeah, so the stations at the Embarcadero that are funded through the ATCD grant have a 40% match requirement. So uh, there are some city funds going into that. The, the stations that are potentially going in at Del Mar Park are through a Cali VIP grant. I'd have to double check on the on the match requirement. I believe there is a match, but it's small. Um, so I yeah, I would need to check on that. So in essence, uh, at most forty percent, uh, but that for the most right. part yeah. less than that. Yeah. Okay. Well, and if I may clarify, um, I'm thinking of a, of a past role um, here. Uh, we are working with a company called Zero Impact Solutions, and their whole business model is that. Um, there, there is no financial impact to the city. So actually, the chargers at Del Mar Park um, would have no upfront cost to the city. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. This is a receive and file. Unless there are any other comments on this, we will receive it. Yes. Quick comment. Kudos to staff. This is a long list, and I know this yeah. is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I applaud you for bringing it forward and actually discussing this early in the, <laughs> in the game. So... Thank you for that, and keep up the good work. Appreciate that. I just wanted to thank the most well. Absolutely, really quickly, go ahead. Because yeah. I reserved my comments. Oh, no, no. yes, I'm um, sorry, no, go you ahead. Know, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you, um, staff, for your work on this, your continued work. Um, I'm impressed. It is a, it's a large list, and so all of your work is a, very much appreciated. And, um, and I do uh, thank you, um, Mr. Collins, for keeping us up to date. I really appreciate that. Um, as Councilmember Barton said, sometimes you kind of forget the long list of what, <laughs> what they are. I mean, you look at, through them and you focus on certain ones, but um, it's always great to see the full list before us. So that is all I have to say. And good. For, thank you for that because, and I mentioned it up front before I opened up um, your questions, but um, behind every one of these is a tremendous amount of work. And if you have any intimate interaction with any of our city employees, you will begin to understand what goes into that. And that's why we often talk about capability and capacity um, when we bring new things forward. Speaking of which, that brings us to item D, future agenda items. I'll make mine simple, I promise. Um, you're supposed to bring back C1 and C2 on 628 for final review. I'm simply asking, and, and maybe uh, Mr. Newmeyer could tell me if it's okay to include this. I'd just like to add that we include an estimate of the future general fund subsidy required to continue to provide um, city services for both C1 and C2. That's a simple request. Is that? Uh, that could certainly be added to the staff report at the discretion that, of uh, city staff. Yeah, if I can get some support. Uh, I, su I support that. Good. Jeff, is that good for I'll what we were talking it. about? Yes. Yeah, good, okay. Staff, uh, Scott, is that, would that be okay? From a capacity standpoint? Mr. Qualick. Trying to get an idea of general fund depletion in the future. That's my goal. I'm sorry, I was, yeah, that's a yes. I was, I was distracted, okay. yes. Okay, so on that note, uh, seeing that sedation has uh, crept into the meeting, um, unless there are any other future Agenda items, looking here, no? Well listen, thank you all for being here. I'm not sure if we have a, um, a video audience, but um, that ends our meeting. The next meeting of the Morro Bay City Council will be held on Tuesday, May 24th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Uh, right here at the Vets Hall. Thank you, good evening, and uh, thank you for the privilege of your time. <laughs>